that. Turn with me, if you would, Matthew chapter 7. While you're turning there, just a couple quick things. Don't forget, I I'm, I'm just want to emphasize this, on April the 7th, uh, we're having an opportunity for any of you that would like to be involved in church activity as far as, um, you know, whether it be with our children's ministries, I say activity, I mean ministry, um, or whether it be music, whether it be buses, uh, sound, video, anything, we're going to have what we call a job fair on April the 7th, and we want you to take advantage of that. We'll have tables set up downstairs explaining some of those things. We'll have people that will speak to them. Uh, we'll have refreshments for you so that you can have an opportunity to, um, uh, to, to snack and talk and do all of those kinds of things. I'll be sharing with you some of the qualifications and all those kinds of things that are involved in that. And so we'll have all the, any paperwork that might be involved as far as child care and being able to take part in that. We'll have all that available. We just want to make sure that you're being used in the way that you think God would have you to be. And we want you to be involved in church ministry. So we want to make those opportunities available for you. Also, I want to say 50 plus, we had a great time last night. Uh, we had a really good time, enjoyed one another's company, had a good crowd. We went to uh, see the Passion Play and just really enjoyed our time together. So appreciate you guys that were involved in all of that. Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to actually kind of finish up this little four-parter inside of our broader uh, perspective. Proclaiming God's Word is our theme for this year. And so today I want to talk about the idea, we've, we, we've talked about the foundation, uh, God's Word being the foundation for a person's life, for a family, for our nation. Today I want to deal more with the church. God's Word needs to be the foundation for our church. Um, Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 says this, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, do with them, I'll liken him unto a wise man to build his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Rain descended, the floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So when we're dealing with our structure, whether it again, whether it's our individual life, our family, our nation, our church, it has to be founded upon the rock, and that rock is God's Word. That's where we stand. If our foundation is not in God's Word, whatever it is we're building is going to crumble. So today I want to talk about the foundation upon which the church is established. And it too is established upon God's work. Uh, we used these verses earlier when I dealt with the family, but I want to say them again in relation to the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, picking up in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might, listen to this, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I think it's really important that the church, the very bride of Jesus Christ, that we understand that the church is cleansed by God's word. It becomes glorious. It is presented unto him without wrinkle, without spot. It is holy, without blemish, because it is cleansed by the very word of God. That's important. If the church is founded upon anything else other than the word of God, if it's founded upon man, man's thoughts, man's ideas, if it's founded upon entertainment, if it's founded upon programs, even if it's founded upon good music and theatrics and lighting and buildings and property and numbers and finances and you name it, if it's built on anything other than God's word, it is destined to fail because it's built upon sand rather than the rock. So we understand that the church is made glorious by the cleansing of God's Word. That's important to us because we being the Hilltop Baptist Church believe ourselves to be a church founded upon the rock. And so we need to understand that as a church we need to make sure that all around us realize that we believe and we stand and we teach the very Word of God and that alone. For this reason, I think the church has to stand upon 
the doctrines of God's Word, the commands of God's Word, the promises of God's Word, the teachings of God's Word. All of these things are important if we are going to be the glorious church that stands firm when times of trial come upon us. You know, I don't know if you realize this or not, but there will come a day where the church will be tried. There will come a day where folks are going to trouble the church. There are nations where the church today cannot stand in public. There are nations where they meet secretively in people's basements or in caves or in anywhere they can meet because the government will not allow them to meet. There are folks who are standing because they believe God's word to be the absolute foundation of all that they believe and all that they stand upon. When we look at this, we realize that the church, like one's life or like a marriage even, stands upon the word of God. And has to stand upon the word of God. And if it doesn't, when the storms arise, the church will fall just like nations have fallen. The church will fall just like individuals can fall. The church can fall just like families have fallen. It may not to have appeared to have fallen in the eyes of people. In the eyes of people, they may look at the church and say, Oh, it's prospering. It's doing well. Great numbers, great finances, great buildings, great things. But in the eyes of God... We don't stand upon God's word. It has failed. Amen. Give you an example. The church of Laodicea. Church of Laodicea was mentioned in Revelation. In Revelation, he mentions these churches. Laodicea being a church that thought themselves to be very rich. They were very affluent. They were a church that viewed by man looked as though they were everything that was blessed of God. Man, they had riches. They had numbers. They had buildings. They were a great work as far as man was concerned. But we find in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, it says this, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. God sees the church in an entirely different way than what the world sees the church. And the God sees the church as people who are faithful to his word, who are faithful to his commands, who are faithful to his message. He doesn't see the church as a place where we can just increase in number. He sees the church as a group of folks that are faithful to him. He sees us for who we truly are, whether or not we're founded upon, cleansed by, trusting in his word. So let's begin. The church... And its mission is to be established and to establish in the hearts and lives of people God's Word. We have a responsibility to do that. We have to be established upon God's Word. Let me give you some examples. In the church, we find that God has given us some incredible commands. We can begin with the Great Commission. The Great Commission basically is going to all the world preaching and teaching the gospel. Amen? That's the idea, baptizing them and, and then teaching them some more. Discipling them, making them what God would have them to be. It's the Great Commission. He tells us that in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus voiced this command to the apostles. Now keep in mind, he had his apostles gathered around him, and he gives them this command to do that. Now in that day and in that time, keep in mind, Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. The apostles are the foundation of the church. And so he is telling the foundation of the church, those who are going to do a great work, come Pentecost, he's going to empower that foundation, and we're going to see the church begin to grow, leaps and bounds. And so what we find is that foundation needed to be established upon God's word if God was going to be able to do anything with them. And so he tells them, this is what you are to do. They had to trust Jesus' word so that they might be able to accomplish what God wanted them to accomplish. We find that they gathered together before Pentecost. There was about 150 of them. And in so doing, we find that that church was filled with the Holy Spirit of, uh, of God. And as they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, they began to preach to the people who had come to town to celebrate Pentecost. And 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ. All he did was get up and preach the word. I don't find anywhere there where they got up and said, hey, wait, we can't have a service yet because we don't have the right lighting. 
Whoa, 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 wait a minute. We've got to make sure we got pews. We've got to make sure this is comfortable. Has anybody got the air conditioning on? They didn't worry about any of those things. Hey, John, can you juggle? We need something to get their attention. None of that took place. They got up and they preached the word of God. And 3,000 people got saved. Understand and know that the foundation of who we are is built around the very Word of God. Notice what Peter said when he kind of wraps up his message. Not totally done yet, but now he's brought them to a place where they need to make a decision. In Acts 2.36, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. I love this picture. Because what happens here is he preaches to them out of the Old Testament. He preaches them out of their very law. He preaches them out of the very prophets that have spoke before him. He preaches to them things that had previously been a mystery and now he opens them up to them so that it might reveal to him uh, to them that Jesus was indeed the Messiah they were looking for. It was the, the very Son of God. Their only hope for salvation, his death, burial, and resurrection was done so that they might have eternal life. And he begins to preach that to these folks. And he tells them that very Christ is, is both Lord and Christ. And I can almost imagine here for a moment, maybe a pause, maybe a moment to let that sink in. Maybe a moment for them to ponder what they needed to do. And in that moment after he had preached this and proclaimed the word, this challenge that he presented to them, the church is obligated to preach and teach these words. And I understand that when he does so, there was a responsibility on their behalf to respond. I look at this, and I understand that we live in a different day. I get that we live in a day where there are things that need to be done in order to reach folks. I kind of get that to some degree. But I'm going to tell you, we can't ever let anything replace God's Word. In that moment of pause, I would imagine they were looking at each other going, what do we do now? I wonder what happens now. Based on that, what should I do? And then somebody voices it. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? He issued them a challenge out of God's Word. I'm here to tell you there has never been one single solitary soul whose heart has been pricked to the place where they want to know what God would have them do because someone has entertained them. Never has there been anyone under conviction because of a program. Never has there been anyone under conviction because we told a few jokes and made sure that we kind of grabbed their attention. We come under conviction by the very Word of God. When we understand what God has said and we understand how it applies to our heart and to our life and we get it and we look at our life and we say, I'm miserable and I need Jesus Christ. It's the Word of God that pierces our heart. The preached Word of God moved the people and compelled them to act upon the challenges proposed by Peter. Now I get, again, this nation that we live in. I understand that, you know, they tell us that we are an entertainment-driven society. I believe that. I believe that, you know, we're living in a day where the latest and greatest teaching techniques are all the rage. I get it. You know, I get that there's never a moment of just sitting around because we're bored. When I was a kid, I was bored sometimes. But you know, kids don't get bored today because they have all the capabilities of tech games, cell phones, constant videos and games. But when it comes to spiritual matters, let me tell you something that is so important. None of that speaks to the heart and to the life of an individual like the very Word of God. And folks, as much as we might think it has to be done and it has to be taught, you know, we live in a different day. When I was a kid, I'll be honest, you know, you go to your class. When I, when I was in school, we would go to our class and we sat and we listened to the teacher. If we didn't, we went out and got swats. I know that's foreign to people today, but we got in trouble for not sitting and listening. Now, you know, the idea is, listen, they're not expected to sit and listen because you have to entertain them so that they can grasp it. 
I get that we're in an entertainment age and we're talking about learning your numbers, learning to read. I get all of that. But I'm here to tell you, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when it comes from to, to hearing God's word, to standing upon God's word, I need nothing but God's word. It speaks for itself and it speaks to the heart. And I am not going to discount what the Holy Spirit of God can do with that to say that it has to have this or it has to have that. We need to know that what Peter preached was simply God's Word. I don't think he juggled to get their attention. I don't think they had light fixtures sparkling in the background, doing blue sometimes, red sometimes to draw their attention. I don't think they had pyrotechnics. I don't think they did all the, the smoke and what have you. I think they just preached God's word. And people were moved. And people chose to come to know Jesus Christ. Just God's word. You know, it's funny. In our society, we have churches that feel like we have to do those things. There are third world countries, as I mentioned before, who cherish just being able to sit in a little Bible study, having to hide out. There are those who would love to have God's Word in their language. There are those who cherish the thought of having a Bible in their hands. I have in my office, I don't know how many Bibles, I have boxes of Bibles. I, truth be known, in this church, we probably have hundreds upon hundreds of Bibles floating around this church. At any moment, if you need a Bible, you can go to Brother Cody and say, Brother Cody, I need a Bible. I can guarantee you within a minute you'll have one in your hand. Amen. There are countries who cherish yeah, yeah, yeah. that Bible because they can't get another one. Amen. They'll have a Bible in their hand and they cherish it because they know that if they lose it, if it's destroyed, getting another one is not an easy matter. They love the Word. Folks, it's the Word of God that changes hearts and changes lives. And simply because we're in a society that treats it differently, punting it like it's a football, amen. I got news for you. It's still precious. And it's still the foundation of who we are. Do not forget that the church is established and built upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Every word that He has given us in this book needs to be honored, and it needs to be kept. His Word has to be the foundation of all we do. Matthew 16, 18, notice what Jesus says uh, when we're talking about this. He says, upon this rock, not sand, upon this rock, I will build my church. He did not say, upon the sand, I'll build my church, because the next the very next statement reveals why his church is built upon a rock. And so he gives us his word, by the way, so that we have a rock to stand on. This is Jesus' word when he says he built his church upon a rock. This is the rock he's referring to, built upon every word that he has given us. That's why you can't separate Jesus from his word, by the way, because we are told that he is the word. He, broke, he spoke all things into existence. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was who? God. Jesus is that Word. When we get the proclamation of what He says, everything that He says is, a, is just a picture of who He is. This is Jesus. And so when he says that upon this rock I'll build my church, he tells us the reason for that in that very next statement, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's saying when hell comes against you, when Satan comes against you, when times of trouble and trials and all of those things stand against you, you are standing on a rock and you can't fall. The gates of hell shall not prevail. doesn't say that it won't try. Doesn't say that he won't beat on the doors. Doesn't mean he won't huff and puff and try to blow the house down. What it means is he can try as he may and he can't. When we stand upon God's word. Not only do we have the great commission, but how about the ordinances? Something as simple as baptism and the Lord's Supper. The church has two ordinances. Those two ordinances are established upon God's Word. Baptism, the Great Commission, commanded that we baptize believers. 
at Pentecost, all of those who, uh, who received Jesus Christ were baptized throughout the early church, all the way through the book of Acts. We find out when people came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they followed in baptism. It's an act of obedience. It's something that needs to be done. And so what we find is every time we see people trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, He baptizes them. We're told that Jesus and John the Baptist, when they went down to baptize Jesus, it tells us that they went into the water together. They came up out of the water together. They weren't sprinkled. They weren't poured upon. They went down into the water. The word baptism means, by the way, immersed. They went under the water and they came up representing the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How do you know that, Pastor? Because His Word says it. And I stand upon His Word. It is my foundation. I can't change it. I can't alter it. I can't decide to do it some other way. I'm given a lesson on baptism and instructions on baptism because I need to follow what God has to say about baptism. A foundation regarding this ordinance is in God's Word. And again, we can't change it. We can't ignore it. We can't assume that it's some trivial matter that we can just do some other way. We can treat it as though it's not necessary. Folks, when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should follow in baptism because God said it in His Word and we are to follow His commands. God's Word sets the standard. If we are choosing to ignore this foundational truth, we are building our house on sand. And any church that chooses to ignore this foundational truth is building their house on sand. Well, the Lord's Supper is the second ordinance. As a local called out assembly of believers known as the Hilltop Baptist Church, we have an obligation based upon the foundation of God's Word to observe the Lord's Supper among all of those that are a part of our church. We have an obligation to do that. We get our instructions, how it uh, needs to be administered, to whom it's to be administered, the elements that are to be used as we administer it, the purpose behind doing so. We have all of that where? In God's Word. If it were not for God's Word, I'd have no clue. Now, I can make it up as I go. I can say it doesn't matter what God's Word did. I'm going to do it my own way. But if I do, then I'm building a house on sand and I've ignored God's Word. Folks, we need to understand and know as often as we do this, it has to be according to God's Word. It's a fundamental truth. It's what God would have us to do. It's what God would have us. It's the way He instructed. Christ instructs in Matthew 26 so that we can get a clear clear idea of what needs to be done. Then we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He gives us some things that we need to know about it. He gives us some warnings about it. We understand that, listen, God's Word will spell these things out for us, but we need to have a foundation upon His Word and know that it's truth. I don't have an option. I can't decide to ignore God's Word. My only option as Christ's church is to stand upon His Word. I can't do anything else. How about doctrines? Well, it's a common theme these days. Let's do away with doctrines because doctrines get in the way of fellowship. Man, let's do away with doctrines because doctrines will cause problems. Too many divisions when you start talking about doctrines. I'm going to agree with you. It divides the world from the church. Doctrines is what divides God's will from man's will. So when we look at this, doctrines are basically just statements of belief, whether it be regarding sin, salvation, the deity of Jesus, the church, the ordinances, anything you want to talk about. Doctrines are what we believe based upon what the uh, Word of God says about it. And so when we look at that, we have to have a foundation that establishes what we believe. Well, Pastor, what do you believe? Well, I try my very best to identify that in the preaching and in the teaching. We try to identify that in the things that we establish about where our church stands on different things. We, we even try to identify it to some degree by the sign that's out on the street, though we don't have much of one right now. Tells them that we're a Baptist church. It at least narrows it down for them to some degree. We let them know that, listen, this is where we stand. This is what we believe. We, we, we believe that without doctrines, there is only confusion, and the foundation is God's Word, and we ignore God's Word when we say that we can ignore doctrine. It's not what I think. It's not what I've experienced. It's not how I feel. 
It's not what I've been told by somebody else. It's what God's Word has to say. And if we don't acknowledge what God's Word has to say, then it resorts back to me, and now it's all about me, and I become God. I can make the rules. Now I can say what's right and what's wrong, because I've thrown God's Word aside. And I established the rules, now I become God. You know, Jesus made it very clear that God built the foundation of doctrine. Do you know that? A lot of people say, well, I don't, I don't get this. I had one guy, a preacher friend, told me, he says, I think doctrines are a problem. I said, you do? I said, How, how's that? Well, I just think they're too divisive. I said, well, they are divisive because, quite frankly, you know, God, Jesus Christ is, is an enmity with the world. We get that. The world's going to hate him. Hated him before he hated us. All right, before it hated us. But what we find is when Jesus came, he tells us this in John 7, 16. This is the verse I shared with him. I said, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his has sent me. Huh. Interesting, isn't it? He's saying God has a doctrine. And what I'm preaching and what I'm teaching to you is the doctrine of God. Amen. He understood that. He realized, that, listen, there has to be a foundation. If we don't have a foundation, we stand on nothing. It's sand crumbles from beneath us. For that reason, we're told there is no private interpretation of Scripture. Uh, 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. All Scripture has one interpretation. I know there'll be people who argue with you, well, that's the way you see it, and this is the way I see it. Well, then one of us sees it wrong, because there is, or maybe both of us sees it wrong, but there is only one interpretation. What God says is what God means. He doesn't say something expecting you to take it 12 or 13 different ways. What God says is what God means. There's but one interpretation. I know there's a lot of folks that will disagree with that. But understand, there may be many applications. I might apply it to different parts of my life. But what God means in His Word is absolutely true. And He doesn't mean for us to divide it up and to tear it apart and to make it say whatever it is we want it to say. If at any point you have the idea that doctrine is not important, you need to heed God's Word. Titus 2.1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Then with instructions regarding sound doctrine, he continues on in verse 10, he concludes with this, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, to all things. That means God has a doctrine about everything. Not some things. God has a doctrine about everything. Everything in the world has an underlying foundation that God has established. There's an understanding about why. There's an understanding about who that God has established. Now, I may not always get it. I may not always understand it. But the fact is, God has established a foundation for us, and that foundation is established in doctrines which are presented to us in God's book. Amen. 51 times in Scripture, 51 times He uses the word doctrine. 45 of those are used in the New Testament. Let's take this on to another point. Second thing I want you to see is the gifts of God are for the purpose of understanding God's book. You know, a lot of churches really emphasize the gifts, and that's okay because I think, I think we have gifts, and I think those gifts ought to be utilized, and I think they're good in the church. Some of the gifts that were in the early church are not in the church today, but we have gifts of our own, so that's all well and good. But God has given us the gifts that we need, but here's what you need to understand. The majority of those gifts are for the purpose of either understanding God's Word or proclaiming God's Word. I want you to listen to him. Ephesians 4.11, he gives the church some very unique gifts. He says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He gave us the apostles and the prophets in the early church so that we would have a foundation to stand upon, a foundation that was sure. And then when he began to build upon that, he built upon that with gifts of the preachers and teachers and evangelists. And by the way, evangelists in that day were more missionaries. All right? And so we see this picture of these folks that have the idea of proclaiming God's Word. That's, that's their job. Proclaiming God's Word, teaching God's Word, giving you an understanding, discipling folks, this is what the gifts were for. 
so that we might have a foundation that we know how to utilize and know how to build upon. You know, when we look at this, it's an important passage. Ephesians 2.20 says, talking about the uh, apostles, he says, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So Jesus formed this foundation, he being the chief cornerstone. And as I said, then he gives us evangelists, preachers, teachers, for the purpose to proclaim God's word, teach it and understand it. You know, even some of those early churches, those early gifts that were in the church, you think about some of those. For example, they were given gifts of prophecy. Before the Bible was complete in the early church, they didn't have the word of God like we have it. They were still just proclaiming it. And so they had prophets in the church that God would anoint to, in such a way that they could share with the church what God would have them to know. These are things that we now are able to read in Scripture. No longer needed because we have the Bible. But in the early church, they didn't have that. But the purpose was so that they might know the foundation, know the Word of God and proclaim it. Have it in their hearts. Well, even that of speaking in other languages. People today call it speaking in tongues. By the way, the early church speaking in tongues was just the ability to speak in a language you didn't know how to speak. If I needed a witness to a guy that spoke French, he gave me the supernatural ability to either speak French or for them to have supernatural ability to be able to hear English and understand it. All right? And so that was what was speaking in tongues. And so the purpose was so that I could give the gospel of Jesus Christ, give the understanding of God's word to someone in whose language I did not know. We understand that. We also realize that even the gifts of healing that were in the early church we find that he gave individuals gifts of healing. That was for the purpose of them understanding that, listen, God is behind all of this. We want you to know that this is Jesus Christ, the true Messiah. And so he has the ability to do these things so that you might know that this is the Son of God and that his words are true. Amen. It was to bring them to a place where they would listen to God's word. These are important facts. And the reason they're important is because of this third point. Church is going to be judged based upon this word. It's going to be judged based upon this word. You know, it's interesting. When I talked about the church of Laodicea earlier. In chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, he talks to seven different churches there. And he starts every one of their letters exactly the same way. He says this. He says, unto the angel of the church of... They give their name. They say, write. R -W -R -I -T -E, R-W-R-I-T-E. Write. Write it down. What is he saying? My words are important. They need to see them, hear them. I'm going to give them some instructions. I'm going to give them my word. Write it down so that they have it. He told John to write the words that they were to hear. Their judgment was based upon the words that they were to read. You imagine those churches when they get that letter in hand. The letter comes to them, Church of Laodicea. Oh, man, we got a letter from John. He's out there on Patmos. We got a letter from John. And they open it up and they realize that in reality it's a letter from Jesus. Use John as a catalyst to write it, but, but it was a letter from Jesus. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write. And they begin to read the instructions and they realize, you know, they're looking at themselves and Jesus is saying, you think you're rich, you think you're prosperous, you think you're really something. You're wretched and you're miserable. You're blind, you're naked. Man, this is coming from Jesus. His word was judging those churches. His word will judge churches in every day. When we read those, understand, he wasn't just rebuking them. He was rebuking churches of our day too. When I see the rebuke he gave to those churches, if our churches are just like that, the same rebuke. If he's rebuking them, he's rebuking us. God's word's a foundation and will be judged by every word. You know, Paul's instructions to the church revolved around preaching, teaching, abiding in God's word, uh, knowing that we are judged by the very words that are written in this precious book. It had better be the foundation that we all stand upon. God's book, God's word. Now, I said all that today just to basically say this. Are we standing on the foundation we need to stand for? Yeah, yeah. Or are we on that slippery slope? Yeah, Is our house? Is our house built upon the rock? Or is it built upon sand? We've preached all four of these messages. Is your life 
built upon the rock? Or was it built upon sand? Your family. Is your family built upon a rock? Or was it built upon sand? We know where our nation stands. Our church. Are we built upon a rock? Or are we built upon sand? And folks, when we look at this, it tells me I need to be a part of it. I need to be involved. I need to help establish these things. Here's a church that believes and trusts God's word. This is a foundation. I need to be a part of that. It's time to make decisions that you need to make. I think, I think you need to really search out what God would have you to do. Follow his will and say, God, the word of God is my foundation. If it's a foundation of this church, then I need to be more involved I need to be trusting you, following your leadership. Lord God, today, may I be what you want me to be. Let me ask you to bow your heads if you would. You know, you might be here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. That might be the case. If that's the case, let me encourage you. It has to begin with trusting him. It has to begin by welcoming, welcoming him into your heart and into your life. Saying, God, I, I need to be built upon that foundation. And you tell me the only hope I have is Jesus. He is my only hope. I believe and trust in Him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want that, Father. I want that in my life. It has to start there. Then it, then it continues to be a part of the church that He has established. That He has cleansed by His Word. Be a part of a church it says we want to serve and we want to do as God has called us to do. Today, where's your heart? Where do you stand? Are you ready and willing to say, God, I want to do what pleases you? Dear Father, Lord, I pray today that you'll convict our hearts and lives. Lord, that we might follow your leadership. And God, if you need, you are convicting the hearts and lives today to make those decisions today. And Lord, I pray that we'll not, we'll not push that off, that we'll, we'll do what we're supposed to do. Lord, Father, I want only to please you. Lord, may we stand upon that rock that you would have us to stand upon. In the very word that you've given us, your son, Jesus Christ, Lord God, thank you. In his name we pray. Amen.